Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome to this policy event of the Forum for the Future of Agriculture. My name is Javier Ruiz, and I will be your moderator today. I work for the European Policy Office of WWF, which is, as you probably know well, one of the largest environmental NGOs uh, worldwide. It was only a bit, uh, a bit over two years ago that the European Commission, at the, at the very beginning of its mandate, published the European Green Deal. It may feel now like ages ago. Uh, this was before the COVID-19 pandemic shook the world, at a time when the possibility of a war in Europe seemed extremely unlikely. But here we are today, witnessing these last few weeks a terrible humanitarian crisis and trying to do our best to protect and support the people affected. In the meantime, of course, uh, social and public health challenges continue. The climate and biodiversity crisis have not disappeared and the need to build a more sustainable and resilient future for our societies and for our food systems in particular has only become more urgent. As you know well, the Farm to Focus strategy, which is one of the main building blocks of the European Green Deal, is the EU policy that wants to achieve exactly that. It's trying to make our food systems fair, healthy, and environmentally friendly. And as you know well, there are many policy, different policy initiatives under this strategy, and all of them are important to make progress in, in generally in that direction. But today we want to focus in, in, in one particular uh, policy initiative, which is the new EU law for sustainable food systems. So let me say a few words about, about this new, new law. It has been announced for next year, for 2023, and the preparatory work towards this new EU framework legislation has already started. And it's under the lead of the European Commission's Director General for Health and Food Safety, DG Sante, which, as you know well, has also the, the, the overall leadership of the Farm to Fork strategy. And as a first step in these preparations, the Joint Research Center facilitated last year a process to explore with a number of experts in different aspects of food systems, the possible building blocks for this new EU law. And this led to the recent publication by the JRC of, of a report named Concepts for a Sustainable EU Food System that will be presented in just a few minutes. Later in 20, later last year, uh, in the autumn, the commission also published the, uh, the roadmap that uh, describes the main ideas for this new EU law. The law was presented as an umbrella law, a kind of a lex generalis that would have an, an influence on other more specific laws and that could apply to all actors across uh, the food chain. As you can guess, ideas about the content of the law are still relatively vague. Uh, but what we know is that it could potentially include some mandatory kind of minimum requirements to phase out some of the least sustainable products and, and operations along the food supply chain. But I think that the most, most of the interest is in trying to create some kind of incentives to produce and consume um, more sustainable food. And how is the European Commission aiming to do this? Well, I think that potentially there could be many mechanisms that could be put in place. But I, I would like to underline one main approach that has already been proposed, which is to set up uh, an EU labeling system to inform consumers of the environmental impacts of food, and in this way, try to create a market pool for more sustainable food. In this regard, maybe very briefly uh, mention that also last year, the, the European Commission organized a workshop uh, to build on the, on the EU experience on using marketing standards and explore how we could build on that experience to promote more sustainable production and consumption of food. If we look at how what the commission is doing for in relation to stakeholder participation, uh, let me mention two or three things. Um, DG Sante, as you, many of you already know, is in the process of creating a new advisory group on sustainability of food systems that the idea that it will assist, this group will assist them in preparing uh, new legislative proposals or policy initiatives in this area. The group, the work, uh, the group has not really started yet. Uh, it's announced for the second half of 2022, and it will be composed by, by approximately 100 members, representatives of, of different uh, organizations active at the at the EU level. Also relevant for participation in 2022, maybe sometime soon. We don't have the exact dates yet. The Commission will launch uh, an online public consultation to gather opinions from organizations and citizens on the sustainability of food systems. 
and possibly they will also organize some other kind of more targeted consultations, interviews, stakeholder workshops, well, the kind of package that we, we tend, tend to see when the commission is preparing a new uh, major uh, law. But I would say, and maybe to start a little bit the debate, uh, that even with all these initiatives uh, coming together, all these actions, I believe that it can still be a challenge for what is actually a very diverse European Union to agree on a long-term vision for sustainable food systems. I think that the, uh, the criticism on the quantitative targets of the farm to focus strategy, which is still ongoing, are a proof that there are very divergent views and there's a need to see how we, we can advance in this, in this terrain. And well aware of this, I think is why, why we chose the, the title of our session today, which is Converging Views Towards a Sustainable EU Food System. So how, how should this new EU law on sustainable food systems be developed to bridge those differences? What should be its main building blocks? How can we advance when consensus is, seems that it's just not possible? And in any case, how should the trade-offs of the transition be, be dealt with? And overall, what could be the role that science can play in such a process? These are the kind of guiding questions that, that have motivated us gathering today for this, for this policy event. And to start that, this debate, we have expert input from our distinguished speakers, uh, which you have seen in the agenda for the day and that I will introduce to you uh, as we go along. Well, enough from me for the moment. Uh, I hope these introductory words help set a little bit the framework for the discussion and let's move now to our speakers. So firstly, let me welcome uh, Dr. Laurent Bontou, who is Senior Foresight for Policy Expert at the European Commission's Joint Research Center and one of the three main authors of the report Concepts for a Sustainable EU Food System that I mentioned earlier. We could say that for Laurent, his uh, his daily work is basically to try to inform policymaking with bright ideas and the best evidence available. And for this, uh, he uses participative approaches that are uh, inclusive of all relevant stakeholders, commission, industry, member states, international institutions, civil society, academia. Laurent, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Javier. It's uh, a pleasure to be here, and uh, thank you for having invited me here to share the results of our work uh, from last year with you to yeah, inform this discussion we're going to have today about uh, a future sustainable EU food system. So um, let's jump directly into, into the, the topic. So Javier has already given you the, the, the main presentation of uh, the context for, in which we have performed this work. And so the challenge we were facing was to, to inform our colleagues in DG Health and Consumer Protection, DG Santé, you know, in the best possible way uh, to, to get them started in developing this very challenging piece of uh, legislation, which is supposed to be this, uh, you know, regulation or, 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 I don't know, directive maybe on the sustainable uh, EU food system. <clears throat> so the, <clears throat> the work we did um, definitely started to take a food system perspective you know, as, as a whole uh, to feed the reflection towards this uh, legislative framework. Uh, I think this policy initiative is really one of the first of its kinds uh, in, in the world. It's uh, very ambitious. So we started work in December 2020 and uh, indeed applying a very inclusive participatory process to explore possible building blocks that could be used for a legislative framework for sustainable food systems. So of course, you know, we are the GRC, the Joint Research Center, we're not a policy DG. So the purpose of our work was to provide a, a non-binding source of collective reflection from a broad range of people which have been selected for their in-depth knowledge of various parts of the EU food system. So uh, as Javier was mentioning before, uh, we are really involved people from uh, very many different fields, academia, research, uh, policy making, industry, civil society organizations, uh, EU agencies. And uh, so this project was very intense because in four months we organized 33 participatory sessions, essentially between March and June 2021, uh, where we looked at sustainability you know, in its whole, uh, so not only 
through the economic, environmental, and social dimensions, of course. But we also want it to be a bit more uh, specific, you know, in the middle of this general picture. And so we added two extra smaller legs you know, to, to this, uh, to the three classic legs of, the, of sustainability, which were looking much more at resilience. And I think that the discussion about resilience is taking even more of uh, importance, you know, in, in the last few weeks. And also ethics, you know, all the ethical dimensions you know, on the social side. So what came out of this work is that for the EU food system to really become sustainable, uh, we clearly need to shift, you know, in the paradigm away from the purely productivist view, even though production still needs to be, you know, still needs to be very important, but, but also understand food security in a much broader sense for everyone in the EU, you know, without, you know, the current threats to the environment uh, deriving from the pro productivist, uh, the current productivist perspective. And also uh, providing food to people in the EU while not compromising food systems or food security elsewhere in the world. Right? It's not that we need to pump everything from everywhere else just to feed ourselves to the detriment of others. So that's also very important. So in order to see, you know, to try and take an approach, let's say, that would uh, be as useful as possible for our colleagues in uh, DG Santé, we studied with uh, the identification of who are the key actors in today's food system, which are the potential agents of change and towards whom policy could be applied uh, to make the system evolve towards a sustainable EU food system. So, there was a broad agreement among the participants that we need actually urgent and simultaneous changes across many areas of the food system and across many food system actors to make a success, successful transition towards a sustainable um, food system. So one of the lessons that came out of this discussion was also that Okay, while voluntary approaches have shown some, some benefits, uh, considering the urgency of the change which are needed, mandatory approaches are actually unavoidable. So rules are needed to provide the necessary reliability and predictability for businesses while setting ambitious goals uh, in, in combination with a practical time frame actually to make uh, the sustainable transition uh, you know, useful. Another important element that came out of the discussions was that um, agency, empowerment, and, and responsibility are going to be key. So all food system actors need to do their part for sustainability, for sure. But also we detected that some have a lot more agency than, than others. And in particular, the large retailers, the large food and drink manufacturers, uh, the finance sector, and the international traders were considered as the most influential in shaping the behaviors and the activities and choices of the other actors regarding sustainability. Regarding consumers, we had a lot of interesting conversations. Uh, and what came out of this is that consumers can also wield significant influence, but only when they can be mobilized to act collectively. You know, and then they can become a very powerful actor. But if their behavior remains dispersed, you know, then uh, their influence is much less. But of course, this level of influence can go hand in hand with uh, responsibility and transparency also emerged as a very important uh, parameter in this discussion. So all these actors, uh, they often respond to, to the requirements or the influence from other actors in the system. Um, but some of them, like the you know, primary producers, for example, or the consumers very often have less individual agency. So they have a lot of direct impact on environmental sustainability, for example, or, or social sustainability. But very often they respond to the pressures imposed on them from the manufacturers or retailers or, or the finance actors, for example. And so in order for sustainability to be achieved more easily, they need to be empowered, you know, and so we have to create enabling framework conditions such as favorable food environments also to steer the behavior of the consumers to or, or rewards for ecosystem services for primary producers to really help uh, shift towards sustainability. So in the middle of all these discussions where we actually highlighted, you know, these, these ideas, 
uh, five key building blocks uh, came up that could be providing advice to our policymaking colleagues in terms of how best uh, how how to make the the regulatory framework or the legislative framework uh, successful. So first of all, a lot of the discussion focused around the setting up of a sustainability assessment framework. You know, we have to provide a practical assessment framework. You know, for any policy intending to achieve sustainability. You know, and so in the work that we've done uh, with all these experts, we have started a discussion. So we've made a big table with a number of possible indicators, but only as a starter, because actually investing the time and expertise needed to set up this uh, robust uh, assessment framework would go way beyond the, the scope and the capacities that we had last year when we did this project. But I think we've identified a number of lines to follow in order to make uh, a very robust uh, sustainability assessment uh, framework. So something that is quite important also is that for achieving sustainability, we have to achieve specific, ta specific targets across all the dimensions of this sustainability ass assessment framework at the same time. So we have to have end food security and environmental sustainability and resilience and economic viability and fairness of the system if we want the system overall to actually be sustainable, to be healthy and continue to provide food in sufficient quantities to everybody for the long term. And the discussions stress the importance of assessing impacts from a life cycle perspective uh, to make this actually meaningful. Um, another aspect, another billing block that came up uh, is very important is transparency across the food system. And that emerged as a core principle to maintain sustainability in the food system. And all actors not only need to feed that system you know, with the data that they have access to, but they also need to be able to get from the, the system what data are relevant for their own operations to make enforce, informed choices for the consumers, for example, to for policymakers to be able to have the relevant parameters to, to know how to act and so forth and so on. You know, the suppliers need to know, you know, the data about, you know, the production that they are going to be feeding on. Uh, the retailers also need to have their information. So transparency across the system is actually very important. And right now uh, there was a feeling that there is a lot of data available, but very often not shared enough. And so not everybody had the right amount of data at the right time to actually make this happen optimally. Uh, another important concept uh, as a building block for policymaking was to help people deal with the consequences of the transition. So the transition is going to be very profound. It will generate you know, winners and losers. And so it's very important that the losers, you know, get compensated somehow, you know, for, for uh, their losing position. So as to avoid that, there would become a break on the transition. And... Uh, the transition will require change in many policy fields and at several policy levels, you know, um, both European and, and national, and even actually further local. Uh, and while the long term positive consequences of this change towards sustainability, you know, are clear to everybody, of course, you know, the short term negative consequences need to be dealt with. And so, in order to do this, there was a proposal for an inclusive multi level process hosted but not run by the EU, that would enable a structured, credible engagement of all stakeholders based on sound and comprehensive evidence and allowing for new types of interaction and experimentation. So that's really a, a new exercise in participatory policy making that we were advocating. Next building block is that in view of the systemic change which is really needed, we need to have policy coherence and multi-level governance that would accompany this. The participants in the project really highlighted that in order to drive the necessary change, simultaneous and coordinated policy action across the system, across many policy domains, and that would address the problematic behaviors and interactions between actors would be needed. You know, and coherent governance across all the levels would actually be needed to accompany all this. You know, and that would probably require the um, appropriate institutional structure uh, to be developed in order to, to make a success of such a complex uh, governance endeavor. Uh, the last uh, building block was more linked to the international dimension of the European food system. Um, 
So we all know that the EU is one of the main both importers and exporters of food and feed globally. So that makes us an extremely important actor at international level. And the EU has the ambition to support the global transition to sustainable agri-food systems, which means that we need to engage very much with the international level uh, to be able to actually make the success both of the sustainable transition of the EU food system inside the EU, but also to stimulate uh, the evolution of the rest of uh, the global food systems into uh, towards uh, sustainability. And we are very conscious in this that food consumption in the EU sometimes has positive effects, but it can also have negative effects uh, internationally. And so that needs to be taken care of. And so discussing about the sustainability assessment framework in view of our connections to the international trade in terms of food, uh, people express the, the need that sustainability standards, you know, would be key elements for sustainable international trade you know, possibly based on a further prioritization of the selected criteria for the for the sustainability assessment framework, and um, so we'll come for the lessons, you know, from from all these discussions. Uh, so, how to make the EU food system, you know, sustainable in practice? I think one of the challenges is that you know a regulatory, you know, or, or legislative instrument, you know, for, for food system sustainability is difficult to put in place because it's not a, a, a single endpoint type of instrument. You know, for DG Santé in particular, it's not as easy as to regulate for food safety, which is really a, a, a single endpoint, which is uh, technically easy to characterize, for which you know what rules to put in place uh, to regulate the market. Here we have a multi-prong, the multi-dimension you know, field to regulate. And so that's going to be very challenging. And uh, while the regulatory framework, you know, is supposed to be presented by the commission at the end of uh, 2023, you know, when we estimate the timeline for the legislative process to go through, you know, we don't expect to have anything enter into force before 2025. And that's a bit of a challenge in view of the urgency of the sustainable transition. And so people were pushing for any action that could be taken earlier to actually start to be taken earlier, in particular through voluntary agreements, if that can work. So in order to do this, of course, we need to have a systems approach and we need to have coherence across many policy fields because the food system interacts with, you know, industrial policy, with employment policy, environment policy, you know, a lot of policies across the EU, EU responsibilities. And so that coherence and systems approach is, is really important. And one of the ways to achieve this is proposed as being the inclusiveness of all the stakeholders. You know, we need to change the behavior and the responsibilities of all actors in the food system in order to be able to, to, to have a successful transition. And so probably new platforms, new forums and experimental spaces involving all these actors and, and citizens in particular, you know, operating at all the relevant uh, governance levels should be established and linked to enable new forms of interactions, the development of new approaches to actually match the local realities, which are so diverse across Europe, and also to develop a shared vision for the food sustainable, for the sustainable food system of the future. So consumers need to play an active role in this. Um, and um, so the food environments, you know, the concept of food environments was perceived as actually quite important for, for the actors, for the consumers to actually play their full role as actors of, of the transition. And so um, healthy diet from a sustainable food system should be affordable uh, for this. But at the same time, food policy should not replace social or income policies by keeping food prices artificially low. But people felt that, you know, in the sustainable transition, food prices were, would be likely to have a tendency to go up. So I think that uh, in terms of uh, policy making, you know, what uh, one of the con conclusions we came up with is that the definition of sets of concrete targets uh, that focus on desirable outcomes rather than the, on the prescription of specific production processes or, or approaches will be necessary, which is a, a paradigm shift from, you know, regulating things like food safety, as I was saying earlier, where you can have, you know, very specific, you know, technical targets to follow. Here, we, we should focus much more on broader sustainability outcomes. And this will require, of course, a robust monitoring and evaluation framework, which will have to cover a lot of, uh, I mean, the, the many different dimensions of sustainability. 
And so that's really a bit, uh, I mean, in a nutshell, the messages we pass to DG Santé, you know, and to help them prepare for this very challenging task of uh, making our food system sustainable in the short term future. So thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much, Laurent. I think you, you did a very good uh, uh, summary of, of, of all the elements that you, you mentioned in the report. And I must say that from my perspective, uh, having read the report, I mean, it's uh, frankly very well written report. I mean, I think that you, you considering all the process that you, 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 you had to gather input, the very different views, I guess, that were there, uh, you did manage to, to put them in writing in a very detailed and uh, I would say very nuanced way also. You did recognize some of the differences, uh, some of the elements that were coming from the debates and something that even I didn't take part in that process, but you can kind of feel many of the elements that were, were in the discussion. Just maybe, if I may, just a very quick follow-up question, Laurent, because you did mention this uh, proposal to have this, uh, uh, in terms of participation, to have this kind of inclusive multi-level process hosted but not run by the EU, etc. And I was wanting to, to hear from you, uh, how do you link this proposal or how do you see, uh, connect this to this advisory group that I mentioned at the beginning in the introductory works that the, the works that the uh, EG Center has set up with certain, to reach out to certain organizations as an uh, maximum about 100 members. Of course, I, I don't think that this group all alone meets the, the, let's say, the suggestions that you were making in the report of a more kind of multi-level, more uh, with more, more positive, more possibilities for other stake, for all stakeholders to take part, but maybe it's part of those efforts. So I wonder whether you see that the, the value of this advisory group that has been now set up by, by DG Sante, whether it should be complemented by by other actions. Uh, I don't know if you could go any, into any further detail there. Thanks a lot for your positive words, uh, Javier. Um, so yes, I think that this uh, stakeholder group, you know, advisory group is gonna be important, you know, for managing, uh, you know, this very complex structure. You know, we have to engage in a systemic transition and we have to make sure that all the, I mean, everybody, is, is engaged you know, all the way down to the, you know, every field and every, every company involved in the food system. So this is, I mean, this advisory group is not gonna be enough at EU level to do this, but at the same time, in order for this to function, you know, we, we insisted on the, on the need for coherence, you know, and coherence will need, you know, coordination, exchange of information. So that's why transparency is so important, but somewhere you have to have focal nodes, you know, for, the information to come together to be, you know, uh, understood, you know, in a similar way, and then flow back, you know, to to the different regions of Europe to be interpreted and applied as it makes sense in every region. You know, you don't grow tomatoes in Finland as much, you know, as you do in, in Italy, for example. So, so you know, the realities of the food system on the ground are so diverse that on the one hand, you have to have a very strong mechanism to understand the principles behind the sustainable transition and so that everybody is calibrated let's say on the on, on the same vision and at the same time understand the diversity of the reality on the ground enough so that we can apply them differently so that they make sense you know at, at the local level and so this kind of bodies at at, um, at at the central level i think are going to be very important in creating this coherence you know coherence and diversity that's really a key challenge uh, that people are going to have to face in the sustainable transition. Thank you. Let me then maybe I would like to also like to hear from our panelists today and see what what the, so they have the opportunity to react also to to what you presented as, a, as in your in your report and also to start to give their their views on the wider sustainability challenges. So let me then maybe move on to presenting our panelists who are uh, Petra Laux and and Sylvia Schmidt. And I will also take the opportunity to introduce our next speaker, who is Jessica Duncan, because likely she would like also to, to have a few uh, comments on, 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 on the report. So if we start with Petra, uh, Petra Laux is head of uh, business sustainability for Syngenta Crop Protection as a, well, a very well-known global leader in, in plant health innovation. Petra leads a global team responsible for sustainable and responsible use of Syngenta crop protection technologies. And her team is also responsible for public affairs and public policy. We also have Sylvia Smith, who is a policy associate manager at IFOM Organics Europe, which is the European Association for Organic Food and Farming. 
her expert expertise lies in agri-food policies with a focus on topics related to sustainable food systems, sustainability labeling, green public procurement and organic processors and retailers. And as I said, also, let me just introduce already our next speaker, Dr. Jessica Duncan, uh, who is associate professor, uh, professor in the politics of sustainable food systems at the Rural Sociology Group in Wageningen University in the Netherlands. Jessica holds a PhD in food policy from uh, City University London and is one of the authors of the report, uh, Resilience and Transformation that was produced for the European Commission by the fifth uh, SCAR, uh, the Standing Committee on Agricultural Research uh, Foresight Exercise Expert Group, which had as a focus the topic of food system uh, trans uh, transitions towards a safe and just operating uh, space. So maybe we have Petra, Silvia, uh, Jessica, Petra, would you like to, to give it a start with, with some comments what, uh, about the, the JRC study, some of your, your reflections on the topic? With, so. with pleasure, Jabi. <clears throat> so first of all, I'd like to congratulate the JRC for pulling together this comprehensive report, which provides us actually with a good starting point in how we approach the topic. Because if you want to be successful and develop legislation, it's key that we are all aligned on what we actually mean by sustainable food systems. So what are we trying to achieve? From a, from a Segenda perspective, I would like to highlight three points on the report. First of all, we very, very much support the five dimensions of sustainability you have been chosen. It is very much what guides our business also today and how we constructed our good growth plan, for example. Now, in the last months, the, the issue of food security has certainly stepped up in relevance, but we still concur with the JSC that food security needs to go hand in hand with long-term sustainability of the ecosystem. And it is far more than just securing yields. But yields remain important. In the EU, they are far too often taken for granted. And uh, we need to make sure in this respect also that we should not achieve compromising ecosystems elsewhere, just shifting the footprint out of Europe. So we very much support that any legislation needs to consider these complex interfaces. You also talked about policy coherence between systems and players and deliver on all five dimensions. Second comment, um, we believe thus that any EU food systems legislation needs to be outcome-based to make a real impact. Um, and so we very much like this idea of building this sustainability as assessment framework for the European food system. We need to make sure that this framework and corresponding indicators are based on a real world impact so that we get an accurate overview of how sustainability policies are impacting food production and consumption. This means we need to keep looking at agro systems at economic needs, at ecosystem impact, and the societal preferences <clears throat> to achieve this policy coherence. We have some ideas on how to establish such a system for agriculture, and we might come back to this later. And thirdly, and lastly for this round, um, the one point that could maybe have been more stretched is the access of new, new technologies to the market. So as, as Syngenta, we are investing in technologies that help making farming more sustainable. We believe, like you say, that farmers need to be helped with this transition. And we cannot tackle food sustainability and security by restricting options for farmers without offering them alternatives. And so this is why Europe and the sustainable food systems policy needs to look at updating legislative frameworks to enable the use of for example, new genomic techniques, biopesticides, and any other technology that will increase the sustainability of the food system. So I leave it at, at this and uh, back to you, Xavier. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you. Thanks very much, Petra, for these uh, initial comments. I'll just hand it over directly to Silvia. Maybe Silvia, you want to make some, some comments. Yes, indeed. Thank you, Xavier. Uh, and thank you, Laurent, also for the really interesting presentation about the report. Um, I'm happy to be here to sort of comment uh, on the report and give uh, IFM Organic Syrup's view on, on, on the great work that you did. And just one point more on IFM Organic Syrup, um, because it, it's, it's often unclear. So we represent both the movement, but also actors in the supply chain. So farmers, retailers, processors, and so on. Um, so I think it's really 
important that in the report you looked at uh, the several dimensions of sustainability, as was also said by, by Petra, and this actually is also a testament to the complexity of the food system. Uh, so the food system is really not, you know, living on its own. It's very much linked with um, many other sectors of the economy um, and society uh, today. So for instance, you know, when we speak about society, it's about, yes, um, for instance, wages, but also animal welfare. Um, the food system is also linked to the environment, to biodiversity. And when we speak about the economy, I also mean, you know, a bit in a larger sense. So also, the machinery that, that is provided, any potential input that are provided, or also taxes um, that we pay. And finally, the food system is also linked with health and nutrition. And I think you did a really good job in the report to sort of bring this out and to, as you also mentioned uh, again now, to show how important it is to have policy coherence and policy coordination. So of course, we speak about you know, food safety with the general food law. Um, and as you said, you know, food safety has this clear, um, the general food law has this clear goal in mind, which is a bit more difficult to achieve in the sustainable food systems law. And we clearly have to make sure that, you know, sustainability objectives are really mainstreamed into all food policy related initiatives. And here, of course, I speak mainly of the sustainable food systems law, but also clearly taking into account the work that has been done by the commission on the farm to fork strategy and the biodiversity strategy. And this also is clearly very well connected with the fact that yes, we need policy coherence um, at EU level, but we also need it, as you have said, at other levels. So even the local level, the regional level, the national level, um, this clearly has to work together towards its main goal of transitioning towards uh, more sustainable food systems. Um, and in particular, I, I always, you know, take this example of sustainable public procurement, where we really see that, yes, we need an EU um, framework for it, but at the same time, it's very much linked to local realities. So this is perhaps the example where um, this idea of both a bottom-up approach and a top-down approach is really quite, quite important. Um, another point that I want to mention is the fact that um, this urgency that you also spoke about. And in the report, it says um, significant action needs to start without delay. And I think we can, you know, most of us can agree on that. Um, and this is also linked to the um, IPCC report that the results of the IPCC report that we saw um, lately and uh, recently, and the, even the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres commented on those uh, results of the IPCC report saying delay means death. Um, and, and, you know, that's quite a, a poignant and, and strong point that feeds back to what you have also been saying in the uh, JRC report. Um, in the IPCC report, they do mention that the climate crisis puts 3.4 billion people at risk. So this is really a matter of, of urgency. The last point I want to mention, and you know, coming from the organic movement, I could not not mention it, um, is the fact that rightly so in the report, you mentioned that um, agroecology and regenerative farming could be set as a key principle for agricultural production. And I 100% agree with that. Um, I think it's incredibly important. And these two practices are, well, very close to the organic movement and um, with the same goals and, um, and same same ambitions. So I think that that sentence is absolutely key. And indeed, I do believe they should be set as a key principle for agricultural production. Um, but as you also state in the report, both of these practices and movements don't have an underlying definition. Um, so while if you say that your produce is organic, you are um, legally bound to be following certain practices, this is, this is not entirely the case for agroecology and regenerative. So clearly there's more of a, um, possibility to, um, you know, misuse these terms. So I would have liked to see, you know, agriculture, regenerative and organic could be set as key principle for agricultural production. But again, I have absolutely nothing again against these two practices, which are absolutely um, great and sustainability, sustainable, environmentally friendly. Um, and I think I'll stop here for this first round. And back to you, Javier. Wonderful, Sylvia. I will just do that the same again, Jessica. Maybe I'll just hand it over to you directly. And then maybe after Jessica Loham, you may want to take the floor also to, to reply to some to some of the comments. But for the moment, Jessica, would you like to add a few more? 
Yeah, thank you. I'll be brief. Um, I want to echo the other panelists and commend the authors of the report as well as the participants. I think we can agree this is a really important and timely contribution to the state of the art. And like Sylvia, I agree we need to amplify the call for urgent action made in the report. Importantly, the report reinforces growing calls to move beyond a productivist lens and to see food as more than a commodity. And towards this end, the focus on food environments and making visible the consequences of transition in the short, medium, and long term, and ensuring these are addressed in a fair way is a key contribution. I also deeply appreciate the section on international trade because this is a topic that is often ignored due to complexity and politics. Indeed, it is often presented as a no-go zone in processes um, argued to be the domain of other actors with different expertise. Yet it's clear that addressing trade is key to addressing food system sustainability. So I commend you for taking that on. And finally, just as an educator on food systems, I wanna thank the authors for creating a report I can really use in the classroom that helps to explain these dynamics in a comprehensive and accessible way. Back to you, Laurent. We would like to add some, some comments, some reflections after the input from us panelists oh, and speakers. First of all, I, I want to thank everybody for their words of support. Uh, that, <laughs> I think that when we were engaged in this exercise, I don't think we were as confident as we are now in terms of how this was going to be received, because indeed uh, the complexity is enormous. Um, and so it, it was a bit of a challenge, let's say, to try and pass this message of non-linear thinking and sometimes we had the impression that uh, it was even difficult for some of the participants in the process and, and some of our policy making colleagues uh, to, to grasp because people like to have you know, simple things you know you know what you want to regulate and then you find a way to regulate it and that's it and you know as we have as i was mentioning with food safety you know it's a lot easier to i mean I don't want to remove anything to you know how difficult it is to deal with food, uh, food safety, but still it, it's a lot. It's a, it's a topic which is a lot easier to characterize and for which you can develop you know technical parameters, which makes it you know a lot easier to regulate than than sustainability. And I think in terms of the sustainability, um, you start to discover very quickly that everything is connected with everything, and so you know it's it's hard to find the right balance between not being ri ridiculously simple on the one hand, but not falling into too much complexity on the other hand, because then it's unfathomable and nobody can do anything about it. So, so the, the hard part is to find, you know, strike the right balance. You know, make sure that, you know, yes, you, you involve the international dimension, you talk about the financial actors, you know, the, the new technologies that can help, you know, the, you know, the, and the agroecology also. I think there is a need to move towards a more complex production paradigm in terms of the primary production, because I think we're probably going to have to move away from the massive, you know, single crop, you know, massive production, you know, towards combining types of production in a way that the waste from one can, you know, can feed, you know, the, uh, another one, you know, to try to maximize production and quality um, overall as a system, rather than looking at specific crops one by one. I think that's, that's uh, you know, going towards integration in the view of how to produce food, I think it's gonna be important. But, but uh, I mean, in, in, a, in a three months process with just uh, 45 experts, I think it was really, really a, a tall order to be able to actually distill all the specific lessons that everybody would have to take on their side. So we tried to, to generate an integrated picture that would be a help for everybody to go back and think, you know, how to carry that further in their own specific areas of, of application and of work. Uh, so I think that's our common challenge in the end. You know, I mean, it's not um, up to just a few people in the commission to do something. It's, it's really a, a shared challenge across Europe where all the actors, all the way from the field, or to, to the, the highest spheres of policy making, we'll have to actually work together and, and find a unifying concept, you know, to, to, to work to, towards. You know, sharing a philosophy at the central level, you know, to develop a regulatory framework is, is already very important. But then we'll have to have the relays that can translate that same philosophy into, you know, the, the practice on the ground to make it work. So that, that's, that's going to be a co coordination and a governance challenge, I think, that has been rarely seen in EU policymaking. Thanks very much, Laurent, for those, that additional 
input. Uh, it's true, I mean, the, the complexity of, of the food systems and the multiple dimensions and the multiple elements that need to bring together are, are huge. And then I, so I wanted to just give a, a little bit of time also maybe now to Petra and Sylvia, if they wanted to add maybe some additional items, some additional angles that, that would be worth sharing with uh, with our audience. What other aspects in relation to, to, to this transition to sustainability you would like to, to bring to the debate? Petra, you go first. With pleasure. I wanted to comment on one point uh, you made, Sylvia, which is about the preference for regenerative and organic agriculture. So we, we agree with everybody there's an urgency here to act. And we believe we need to help any farmer to make improvements. And when I earlier said um, that we support outcomes-based measurements, you know, we believe agricultural systems should be evaluated on the greenhouse gas balance, soil health, biodiversity, yield, and uh, water um, elements. And, and it's very important that these five parameters and maybe others, you know, are taken into account rather than that we classify agronomic systems as, as good or bad because we need to move the mass of farmers to more sustainable agriculture, not only those who, who decide themselves to take a specific title. And um, you also say um, it's, it's um, necessary that everybody in every agent here takes its responsibility. You know, this is why we put full power behind in producing these tools for farmers to become more sustainable, like all the new plant protection, the biostimulants for nutrient efficiency, digital solutions that help farmers analyze data, the new genomic techniques, the research into biodiversity and soil health on farm, and even artificial intelligence um, to develop new and better molecules for crop protection. So all of this is, is urgent, and we believe we need to offer this to to every farmer and not only specific um, um, farming systems. So maybe that's a good thought, hand over to you. Uh, sure, okay, uh, thanks for that comment. So um, I, don't, I don't think it's in the interest of anyone saying that there are good or bad practices. I just think that there are some practices that look at transformation in a more holistic way and some that look in a less holistic way. And that's the point I wanted to make. Um, also in terms of, um, of something that I think is really quite important in the sustainable food systems uh, framework, in addition to what we have been saying uh, so far, um, is the whole concept of true cost. Um, and that we haven't mentioned that much, but I know it is in the report. Um, and indeed, I mean, wouldn't it be nice if we only paid once for our food and not about four times as we're doing now, because now we're paying for our food when we go to the supermarket, um, or, or to the market, wherever wherever you go buy your food, then we pay for it in terms of subsidies, uh, then in terms of cleaning, you know, what we're doing. So for instance, cleaning groundwater, and uh, then in terms of health costs for our society. So, you know, just as an example in the UK, which has a similar situation than in the EU, for each um, pound that is spent on food by UK citizens, there is another pound that is spent on um, natural capital degradation, biodiversity loss, um, that related diseases, and so on. Um, and, and so I think that's really, you know, quite important. And I realize it is quite difficult in terms of policy of how to implement true cost accounting. And one, a start could be really this idea of taxation, to use taxation as a tool towards true cost accounting. And this has been um, mentioned in the front to fork strategy, as well as the um, organic action plan. Um, another short comment I wanted to make is about food environments. Uh, you mentioned that Laurent as well. I think it's absolutely crucial to have consumers, um, you know, if I go out in the, in the supermarket or wherever I do my groceries, it's clearly easier for me as a consumer if the most available and affordable option is also the most nutritious, more environmentally friendly option and so on. Similarly, as if I, you know, turn on my TV, if I have an advertisement, you know, I will never have an advertisement about apples, for instance, but, you know, that would be um, the more, let's say, desirable option in terms of food environments. So I think that was very crucial that you mentioned that. And finally, a note on transparency um, that Laurent mentioned several times as well. I think that's cru crucial in, on more aspects than one. So for instance, in terms of, you know, the technologies that we use in terms of the process that has been um, 
that has has been undergone to achieve you know the, the report or even the the law that that we will have and in terms of also conflict of interest potentially i think transparency is really a key word in this and i think also because i, I see time wise i think i'll stop here for the second um for the second round uh, thank you again well, thanks very much for, for that input and thanks very much for for keeping uh, to the time as much as possible. I think you will just let your, just your last comment, Celia, uh, led very nicely to to what we are now going to let Jessica tell us a little bit more more about. You know, it's, it's aspects of uh, transparency, aspects of uh, what do we do with the trade-offs, what what would be the type of transform. When we are talking about a transformative kind of food policy process, like the what we the one we, that we are trying to imagine uh, with this law, I think we today we are. Very pleased to have Jessica, who has done a lot of research on this topic uh, in, in recent years, and she will be able to, to tell us a little bit more uh, about it. We'll give her maybe around 10, 15 minutes, Jessica, whatever you need, basically, so that you give us your thoughts in terms of, uh, you know, how do, how do you deal with participation? How do you deal with disagreement? And overall, what, what should be the role of science and scientists in, in, in this process? So let me hand it over to you, Jessica, and then we'll have another opportunity to, to discuss jointly uh, as I go. Great, thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be speaking with you all today. And by way of introduction, I researched the governance of food system transformations, in particular different mechanisms used to facilitate participation of food system actors in these different processes. Now, a lot of people start to yawn when they hear the word governance, so please don't. Uh, it's become a fuzzword that in many contexts has come to mean everything and therefore nothing. But we need to be talking about governance because it's both part of the problem and central to the solution. I'm convinced that addressing governance is one, if not the most fundamental step to facilitating sustainable food system transformations. The problem is no longer one of knowledge or technological solutions. The challenge is how do we design more equitable and fit for purpose systems of governance? So in the context of the EU law on sustainable food systems, I was asked to speak today about converging views in the context of a key moment in EU food governance. And for the next nine to 10 minutes, I will present results of my research exploring the intersection between participation, disagreement, policy, and science. So it's now broadly accepted that participation is a key condition to the development of policy and legal frameworks. Participation can also be seen as a key dimension through which legitimacy is assessed. There is also broad agreement that pluralistic perspectives are needed to address complex challenges and advance equitable transformations. Plurality of participation is, in, is important to support a foundational element of transformative food governance, what I call democratic directionality. These are the end goals. These are the futures we want. And I completely agree with Laurent that the rules are needed, but shaping rules is a political responsibility that should respond to democratic directionality. The direction of transformation has to be determined through radically democratic processes. Democratic directionality for food system transformation must emerge from deliberation and debate. Recent processes, including the Sapia report, the SCAR foresight report, and the concept report we've discussed this morning, as well as the farm to fork and even the outcomes of the UN Food System Summit suggest we are not far from agreement. Agreeing to common negotiated goals is possible. The work is in validating the multiple pathways to these goals because alignment on the goals does not always imply a uniform trajectory. Focusing on possible futures is one way to do this. It can help people detach from existing thinking routines, foster imagination, and bring in cross-fertilization of ideas. Experience from the last SCAR Foresight expert group found that this approach also supports a move away from technocentric priorities towards a greater awareness of the role of social processes on demand-driven pathways for change. We observed that identifying precise targets can leave less space for interpretation of the goals, while also acting as a catalyst for collective commitments. Now, while participation is at the core of democratic directionality, how to do it remains problematic and contested, in theory as much as in practice. To date, few processes of participation have developed mechanisms capable of managing and ensuring pluralism. Importantly, some of the principles set out in the concept publication discussed today call for rebalancing the power distribution across the food system and for meaningful engagement with relevant stakeholders. The report also highlights the need to include citizens, 
leading to a principle of inclusiveness, and this is to be commended. But building on Javier's question to Laurent, when proposing a process to accompany food system changes and manage tensions, participants of the report proposed establishing an inclusive process to be hosted but not run by the EU. The process is to be co-owned by participants and the process should include all relevant stakeholders, also those who are not often involved. Now, as a governance scholar, a few concrete questions and concerns arise when reading this. Accountability is a cornerstone of good governance and efforts to move particip participatory processes outside the sphere of public governance opens up questions of accountability, notably in terms of answerability and enforcement, but also legitimacy. The shift of ownership of participatory processes away from public institutions is a key feature of what some have called multi-stakeholderism. Multi-stakeholderism, which has also been dubbed networked multilateralism, replaces political participation with models that often lack clear rules of participation, subvert traditional means of political representation, and erase mechanisms of accountability. This form of governance reinforces an all affected principle. The principle is that all those affected by a decision should have the right to participate in making it. And we see this come up again and again in consultative processes. And it's a bit counterintuitive, but the all affected principle is problematic because it fails to account for relations of power and influence. Actors who are more organized or have more resources are able to dominate participatory processes. It also ignores that not all people are affected equally and not everyone has contributed to the problem equally. It often fails to provide structures for the organization or participation of collectives of people or movements, which has been a key, which has been key in other governance spaces for ensuring more equitable and representative participation and securing the rights of participation for those most marginalized by our food systems. I think it's also really important to note that this approach was a key factor in the rejection of the UN Food System Summit by many social movements, NGOs, and researchers. Replicating such an approach at the EU level should thus be avoided. Now, processes of, to can avoid multi-stakeholderism, inter, <laughs> that's a hard word, multi-stakeholderism with the introduction of clear rules of participation, clear categories of political representation, and strong mechanisms of accountability. And I would argue that to date, public institutions remain best suited to lead these. And a shift away from these institutions threatens to weaken our democratic processes. Towards this end, efforts to move away from multi-stakeholderism have advanced the most effective principle. This principle concerns issues of categorization and prioritization of affected food system actors, such as small-scale farmers, fishers, food workers, urban poor, and uses tools such as constituencies and quotas to ensure representation. Now for the skeptics, it is almost certain that the creation of a truly pluralistic space that prioritizes the vo voices of those most affected will lead to increased disagreement and reduced convergence. It's a participation disagreement paradox, but the risk of closing off debate can outweigh efforts to build consensus where there is none. The this only reinforces dominant modes of thinking and relations, which do not serve urgent transformations that are required. So when it comes to food systems, disagreements are not only unavoidable, but efforts to reduce or diminish them serve to weaken transformation by failing to challenge not only path dependencies, but also patterns of subordination and power that limit transformational potential. In this way, we can think of disagreement as transformative, when actors experience a change in their role perception and when changes of power relations are introduced. So now to conclude on the role of science and researchers, it is important to come back to this idea of democratic directionality. Food system goals need to be democratically defined and diverse pathways to achieving these goals need to be advanced by food system actors. I particularly appreciated the statement in the concept report and I quote, influence should go hand in hand with responsibility and transparency will be key. To support this, it is the responsibility of researchers to clarify possible impacts of food system transformation pathways. We need to be identifying the guardrails while also being as concrete as we can about trade-offs and systemic risks. Moreover, we have the responsibility to support the evidence base for evaluating transformative pathways and their impacts as well as to identify the most affected across the divergent pathways. 
Towards this end, as lead author of a group of 20 food systems experts, we have laid out a set of principles for research to, to support transformative food system policy and innovation at the EU level. These relate to responsibility, pluralism, collaboration, and openness. These principles are applicable across different scales and contexts and place, and they put knowledge and policy action interfaces at the heart of food system transformations. As I mentioned at the start of my intervention, governance is both a key contributor to food system challenges and a key part of the solution. Addressing the participation disagreement paradox is critical for supporting transformations that are urgently needed for more sustainable, just, and rights-based systems. Pass it back to you, Javier. Thanks very much. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Jessica, for, for all those insights. I was actually wondering if I if I could if I could tap a little bit more on your uh, go into a little bit more uh, detail because you did mention something that is uh, well you mentioned many things and, and in your publications there are many things that are quite relevant for for the debate we are having uh, today but uh, in the in your recent publication on, on nature the one where you reflect a little bit on the work you did with the uh, with the scar and, and and the process etc you there is kind of a let's say a, a, a line of thought that you say there and it's like for example, the importance of having um, targets that are not too vague, but it's important to go a little bit more specific because that helps mobilize action and, and, and triggers more, more, more uh, clarity in terms of where, where we want to go. Uh, you mentioned also, and, and, you, and, you, and you said it even, even today again, uh, that, that, that you can have um, goals uh, that are largely agreed but that is also that that doesn't imply necessarily that you have kind of a uniform trajectory that you need to follow. That there can be very diverse pathways that go in that direction, and that needs to be acknowledged. And in any case, as you mentioned now, also how research can also um, I mean, scientists can support in let's say in this process of of, of uh, deliberation debate that gives the directionality that you were that you were saying, and that that process is not is not uh, can be perfectly compatible even if, if they are very different directions that can be taken uh, that with achieving the kind of the large, the, the, the end goals, like kind of the largely shared end goals. And if I, if I put that, I mean, seeing that line of thought, which sounds thoughtful and, and very reasonable, but if we look, for example, at, at what has happened maybe in the policy debate in, in, in Brussels uh, and in Europe, in particular with the farm to fork strategy, it's a bit of a, a, a different beast, another type of uh, very specific type of policy, but in a way, we do have some quantitative targets. We do have clarity in terms of some of the direction. Uh, but if you read the text, I mean, there's a lot of attention put on the targets, but if you read the text, this, the commission is, is offering kind of multiple options to go to, to, to get there. It's not, they are not saying, oh, we only need to do agroecology or only, only organic farming. No, they're talking about many options. They're talking uh, about precision farming, uh, carbon farming, whatever you, uh, you, you name it. I mean, there can be many options and that's clearly included there. And I would even say that if you look at the debate or the, uh, let's say, the liberation that, can, that is needed also to give, to get people on board and to, that, to find the, the, the ways to, to get there, I mean, the, the farm to focus strategy is there, but then when we talk about the actual mechanisms and the policy initiatives that are kind of implement the, 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 the orientation, if it's new legislation or other policy initiative, usually there's quite a lot of space for debate, bringing up, I mean, you know, the EU is, is, is quite a complex uh, monster, let's say, in terms of, of, of making decisions with the parliament, the council. I mean, there's many opportunities to have. So in a way, we would have all those elements there when you talk about the farm to focus strategy. And still, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I don't feel that around the farm to focus strategy, there's a lot of, there's more negativeness sometimes now that you feel rather than a, a, a agreement or rather than feeling, okay, let's go and let's see and let's discuss. And, 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 and that's not quite quite happening, even if we tick those boxes, so to speak. So I was wondering if you had any further reflection because of course the commission did the farm to focus strategy now two years ago. And I think it's time to, to also uh, look ahead. We have the sustainable food systems law coming up uh, next year. What, what could be made differently? Can, can, can we approach the topic differently? What could be improved if you would have any particular suggestion uh, to, to be able to, to bring along people to, 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 
maybe tick all those boxes, but uh, or, but also, but also I don't know, take it to uh, to the next level if if you know if you know what I mean. So that 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 the law can really fed, kind of bring together people a, a bit more maybe than the farm to focus strategy has done. I don't know if you have any comments on on that. Yeah, that's a, a huge question. Um, in terms of the reaction to the farm to fork, I think one of the challenges it faced was coming out right before the new cap or right along the cap and the cap led to a lot of disappointment, especially for more, um, from yeah, organizations more aligned with agroecology and food sovereignty and that, at least in the movements that I study, um, led to quite some, quite some shifting in focus. So there could be a, a timing issue there. Uh, in terms of, of participation and how we might try to restructure participation in view of the law, I think looking at best practices and really ensuring um, that there is strong representation of diverse constituencies and not leading this, not leading your classic EU open consultation. Um, and towards this end, maybe the DG Sante panel is a step in the right direction, but I would really encourage them to make explicit the, the power relations within it and also ensure that there is strong representation from the people who are not not often represented or who do not have the capacity to participate to the same degree. So we see in many of these reports that have been done recently that you know this, the voice of small scale farmers are excluded, the voice of the average consumer, you know, not the one who buys organic, but not the one that goes to the community support agriculture, but the average consumer is also not always included. Um, so I think a little bit more work needs to be done in terms of articulating what kind of political representation or what kind of citizen representation or stakeholder representation needs to be happening. I think in terms of, of advancing, I think the farm to fork, yeah, it was, it, was, it was really national in terms of my understanding of how it's been taken up. I think in a lot of, in a lot of contexts, it was welcomed and a lot, it was rejected. And I think that speaks to this issue of multi-level governance. But what I do think the farm to fork does successfully is set out targets. They are targets that are, I think are, are scientifically reasonable and needed. Um, and, I, and, and maybe within sort of efforts to apply this down across the European Union, we can find ways of, of seeking out more concrete visions or, or targets that suit local populations better. But I do think that the EU needs to stand strong here and really take a strong normative and scientific approach and push a radical framework for radical transformations that we need. And, and if I may just even, even a follow-up, I'm abusing a little bit of my position as a moderator, but because you just mentioned the, the scientific uh, support. Uh, just, I don't know if you know, but in the, in the, as part of the EU climate law, so we have a, 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 new, a new climate law that was approved as part of the Green Deal also, and it was approved. And, and this climate law has set uh, one body, which is called the European Scientific Advisory Board on Climate Change. And, and we just have 15 members from the scientific community that have been appointed to be part of that, that board. And I know that you are also a little bit, I mean, in terms of uh, what type of science or what angles of science are uh, covered in some of the, let's say, some of the science policy interface proposals that we've seen in the, in the in recent year, you're also a little bit concerned that sometimes science can also be a bit narrow and that we look at, at, at with, with a, let's say, a more, uh, with a, let's say with an arrow vision at, at, at you know, technology, innovation, et cetera. Can I, I mean, can I ask you, and maybe then we, we continue with the final debate, because I think it's a relevant question. Should, do you think that the sustainable food systems law should have some kind of similar scientific advisory board set up just as the climate law did? Is it something that would be desirable to then inform uh, the, the process is moving forward, assess progress, etc. And and if it is so, what would be the kind of features that such a, a body should have so that it, in a way your concerns are, are also addressed, that it's sufficiently wide and in spectrum and in, in views of what needs to be considered? Yeah, uh, thanks for the question. In a paper published um, earlier this year, we argued, uh, that was published in Science, we argued for a uh, knowledge policy action interface. So to sort of recognize that there is a key role for evidence in feeding into food system transformation, especially into policy and governance and legal frameworks, but that we need to really reimagine um, the boundaries of science and reimagine what kind of science is represented. 
often the humanities, the social sciences, but also very important, especially when it comes to agriculture, very important experiential knowledge is rejected in favor of you know, the natural sciences and the highly quantitative sciences. Um, and this tends to lead to a particular kind of outcome that hasn't served us in terms of transformations. And that is not always well suited to the kinds of system thinking that Laurent and his team put forward in his report, in that report. So if we were to develop a science policy interface for European food systems, I would hope that there was a, there was a strong commitment to, um, yeah, again, radical diversity, pluralism. And I think that the Nature Food Paper we just published, identifying those principles of responsibility, pluralism, cooperation, and openness would serve as nice principles for such a, a panel that's, uh, yeah, that is also responding to de democratic directionality, but doing their best to identify um, the, 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 the guardrails for these kinds of transformations, because yeah, that, that I think is one of the most important roles that, that some scientists can play right now, is just trying to make sense of the diversity of pathways and helping understand where what we know from evidence can be you know, a useful pathway towards our collective goals of food system transformation. Thanks for that feedback. And let me invite again our panelists, uh, and of course, Laurent also, if you want to, to, to join us in the conversation. There's many questions now up for, for potentially for debate. I mean, what, what do you do? Well, there's a space where you can have disagreement, there's trade-offs, how can science help advance the debate? Who, was, who would like to take the, first, the floor first? Laurent, go ahead. And then Sylvia. Thanks a lot, Javier. <clears throat> Jessica and I are very much on the same wavelength. Uh, I think that what Jessica has been saying here is extremely important. Um, and I would tend to make um, one important point, I think, on this. Um, one is the fact that the Commission is pushing very much towards what we call evidence informed policy making. And so there's the GLC is doing quite a lot of work in this. And this is going very much up uh, the road that Jessica was presenting uh, in the last few minutes. So, um, and, and this calls for what more and more of us in the GLC are calling for, which is uh, an evidence landscape. Because there are many different types of evidence which are necessary for policy making. Uh, but each type of evidence is only valid within a specific domain. And I think it's very important for people to be able to understand that both the range of the types of evidence and the diversity of the domains of application of that evidence in order to allow people to use evidence to the best. Because you know, having transparency on this would, on the one hand, help use all the evidence which is available. Uh, we don't always, I mean, we never have all the evidence we would like to have, but we have to make an effort to use all the evidence which is available, that's one thing. And that would also help uh, fight um, the selective use of evidence in policy making that many people try to do when they push a specific agenda. So I think that's quite uh, important. So, so I think that's the first point I would like to make. And my second point is more on the multi-stakeholder approaches, participation, you know, legitimacy, all these kind of things. Uh, I would add buy-in of the results of the policy-making processes also. And, and this, um, I mean, my, most of my work is on foresight and I really like the foresight processes for their capacity to do this, to both include everybody, really literally everybody. So it's very important when you start a foresight process that you actually have a proper recruitment process at the beginning. So you, you, you map the, uh, the expertise and the diversity of perspectives that you need first, and then you recruit people you know, in order to match you know, this mapping. That's one thing. And engaging people in foresight processes also allows to channel differences in opinion. So you don't have to create consensus. Uh, and you can, you, you can highlight and you can actually uh, bring transparency into the different alternatives which are open towards the future. And that can help you both uh, then get into a political process of arbitrage between different options. But it can also help you realize that you don't necessarily have to zero in on just one option, but several options might be playable in different circumstances and that might be much better, you know, the local reality of different people. And so that actually facilitates, in my mind, 
um, you know, the multi-level governance or, or the diversity of implementation of a, of a single philosophy of the COP uh, by being able to imagine, you know, what alternatives could actually function. Uh, anyway, I don't want to speak too much. That's just uh, the two points I wanted to make. Thank you very much, uh, Jessica, again. Over to you, Sylvia. Yes, um, thank you, Jessica, and thank you, Laurent, also for that intervention. I was particularly happy to hear from you, Jessica, that we're not far from agreement. <laughs> that's, that's um, you know, reassuring. <laughs> Hopefully you're right. <laughs> um, and I also um, particularly appreciate this concept, concept of democratic directionality, which sort of talks to me as in, um, you know, taking into account also what the citizen think. And we do have a, quite a good idea of what citizens think at the moment. Um, that you know, animal welfare, biodiversity, and all of these aspects are quite important to them. So, and, and as you said, at the moment, they're perhaps not um, included well enough in, in governance processes. So I think as well as, as farmers, um, I can agree with that. Representing farmers, it's true that um, sometimes, you know, we, we, we feel this sort of lack of, of, of engagement as well. Um, another point that I wanted to mention is really um, the fact that the importance of dialogue. Um, when we, you know, I, I have experienced several times that, you know, I might think, oh, uh, this other, as a stakeholder, you know, oh, this other stakeholder will have completely divergent views and will have no points in common, blah, blah. blah. And that's simply not true. And you only discover that with dialogue. And, you know, people think that, you know, going into dialogue may be something that really slows things down a lot and it's uh, heavy and, but, you know, it's actually the more, most um, democratic thing to do. And it's also, it, it can actually speed things up because otherwise you can find yourselves after, you know, years and years without, you know, interacting too much that you find yourselves on completely different planets <laughs> on things. And so I think that's quite, quite important to keep in mind this idea of, of engaging um, and as a stakeholder of engaging both with like-minded stakeholders as we, as we do, but also with, with perhaps less like-minded stakeholders. And um, just a practical example of something that worked really well with, um, let's say, unusual friends at, at one point was um, on the Unfair Trading Practices Directive, which was about um, uh, unfair practices towards, towards farmer and having a, a legislative framework for that. And there, um, so many associations and stakeholders that usually don't really work together came together and and we worked very well it was extremely pleasant um so i think it's um this this idea of, of engaging um with all stakeholders is quite important and i think i'll stop here i i would have something else but i think we don't have that much time so i'll give the floor back to to other speakers yeah let me Petra, you, would you like to come in now and, and then we maybe hand it back over to Jessica so she can comment also. Go ahead. Yeah, maybe maybe two thoughts to add from a from a practical player experience, right? So one is you said it's important that everybody speaks and people are differently impacted. Now, um, those who are most impact nature actually does not speak here. And for me, this is a huge role of science, you know, to to replace the voice that is missing. Nature doesn't have a voice, climate change, biodiversity, um, and nature also doesn't have a checkbook. So they can't pay for benefits to them in an economic system. You can't generate private money for public good. So that's that's really important, we believe, in this context that, that we make that voice heard. Um, the second maybe is, Look, my, my title is Head Business Sustainability, and I fundamentally believe that every business model can only be sustainable if it's in line with society's expectations. And we, we need better governance to, to achieve this alignment. So in, in the system we are currently working on, we have very different expectations. Um, it's the farmers who pay our bills and only the farmers who pay our bills, and their incentives need to be aligned, we need a business sustainability model at farm level. Um, we are, have, for example, been developing a biodiversity sensor for insects, which we would like to offer to be placed on agricultural farmland. And we are now wondering how can this be made, made happen? So I'm, I'm bringing in this conceptual debate a very practical example. You know, there's something that can help, but if there is no long-term business model to make this interesting, um, and actually unleash this 
um, private sector energy in moving in the right direction, um, we would we will not, or we are just missing one important point. So these were my thoughts to add. Great, thank you. Should I respond now, Javier? Yeah, just to say thank you for the feedback and the additions. I think they're all really important points. And I agree, Laurent, that the foresight opportunity does provide this opportunity to, to move beyond sort of our, our entrenched positions. And, and it also, I think, has not, in many cases, does not adequately do that first step that you mentioned of mapping the actors and ensuring that they're able and prepared and, and at times even compensated. So all of us working on EU projects, trying to bring in fair participatory processes, and there's very few mechanisms that allow us to do that. Um, I think this is also something that we can feed back and consistently try to feed back, that not all people can participate equally and that we need to figure out more just mechanisms to compensate their time, especially when we're bringing farmers in, I think more than anything. Um, Sylvia, you bring up this fantastic point of efficiency and inefficiency. And my experience working in these, um, what I would call politicized participatory processes where there's space for debate and where you have people who are fundamentally disagreeing on this, the, the state of affairs, right? It's not just little disagreements about where to put the, the indicators or how to set the targets, but really fundamentally different worldviews. Um, this is inefficient, certainly. And I think that's okay. I think we need to get over this idea that um, this is going to be an easy ride. It's not. I, when I said that we're close to agreeing on common goals, I mean, really the broad targets, um, it's going to hurt as much as the transition is going to hurt. This process of negotiating um, is not efficient. And what I've seen in other spaces is that this lack of efficiency is what is used by powerful players to shut down the process. And so I think we need to re resist that. Um, just because it's not smooth and just because people are expressing their, their positions that are highly divergent, it seems like there's no end in sight. I think we can always find little segments of agreement, but we also have to recognize and, and validate that disagreement and try and understand the root causes of those and I, identify pathways then within the uh, democratic directionality to allow for those divergent positions. And if I could just end, I think one thing that we haven't talked about today and that I would have liked to see more of also in the report, but also in my own talk, is the importance of um, gender and intersectionality. There is no sustainable transitions without gender responsive policies. Gender responsive policies need to be grounding laws and policies moving forward. And I hope that that can be taken up very seriously in the law as well. Thanks, Jessica. Yeah. We don't have much more time. We're just seven minutes away from our, from our closure, but I will hand back it to you quite immediately. I just wanted to highlight to you a couple of questions that did come through the to the Q and A. Maybe you can you can pick them up while you are kind of making your final your final uh, uh, statement in this final round. So one of them is asking about uh, what we can learn from let's say local or regional initiatives, like local food councils or. Or, or other dynamics that are happening at other level, how can that inform to understand the, um, the, the EU policy making process? And the second one is this kind of uh, second question is about uh, this feeling that sometimes we see many scientists, uh, let's say, a disagreement between what the scientists are calling for and what the actual policy is doing. I mean, the most recent example may have been with some of the uh, recent measures that have been. Uh, applied in the EU in response to the war in Ukraine, et cetera. There has been, again, one scientist, uh, I mean, uh, a statement by scientists calling on a different approach, et cetera. So how do we go about, about uh, this mismatch, let's say, of what seemingly scientists are calling for, are telling that it would be appropriate, and what the policy actually is? I leave it there. I'm not forcing you to, to take those questions necessarily, but if you, I'm just happy to give you a final round, uh, just kind of one, two minutes maximum per, per the person, and then we will close with this. Mm. Who wants to go first? I can start. Yeah, you go. With um, I think we need to recognize that there that science is not consensus. There is no consensus across the evidence, and this goes back to Laurent's point about the evidence landscape and the validity of evidence across different stakeholder groups and different disciplines. Um, we need to, in that sense, I think really, as much as we're working on radical democratic processes, we also need to be enhancing. Um, interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary research skills um, to not let go of our disciplines, but to also be able to read each other's research with understanding. And um, yeah, so I think to assume that um, there is even agreement in the science on how to proceed is, is 
is mistaken. There are definitely trends that we can point to. Um, and in terms of what we can learn from the local level, I think a lot. I think the movement of food policy councils and the rise of urban food strategies has been really inspirational in terms of how you can reorganize local food systems and mobilize people towards food system transformations. But as Laurent's report also points out, that it needs to happen within a multi-governance context, that these cities and that are leading these food policy councils that are trying their best to do this participatory work and reshape their food systems don't operate in isolation of national and regional policy. So trying to, to figure out ways to align and support and to also look at the bright spots at the local level and translate these back up to the European level to ensure that we have diverse represent representation of success stories is really key. Wonderful. We have those uh, questions answered. In a go. Wonderful. <laughs> Thanks, Jessica. So any final words? What would you like to see happening in the next few months, years, in the preparation of the year for the law? Sylvia, you go. Uh, yes. Thank you, Javier. I think Jessica replied to those two questions in an excellent way, so I don't think I can add that much. <laughs> I will only add one um, example, which you, you said, you know, there are some local initiatives which work incredibly well, and they have to um, be aligned with also regional and national initiatives, and, and that's absolutely true. And again, um, I'll take this example of, of sustainable public procurement, where you have some cities where it works extremely well, um, where they have completely transformed the local food system and schools and so on, um, but it's sort of isolated for now. It's sort of in isolation and clearly it should be more in line with the national strategy. So I, I can only 100% agree with what you just said. Um, as concluding words, you know, what I'd like to say is that um, on the sustainable food systems law, I think we can all agree that it is quite a challenging piece of legislation. And Laurent had a amuse-bouche about with, it, with this report. You know, you really realize at what um, level and to what extent it's uh, difficult to put um, all these opinions together to, for a final piece of legislation, and you did it remarkably well. Um, so I do think it's the first of its kind, as the farm to fork strategy was also the first of its kind, and it is a very, very big opportunity, uh, which clearly also comes with both challenges and um, pitfalls as well. I mean, clearly, it, you know, if done right, this can really be the start, or you know, to transforming the food systems in a radical way, as you, Jessica, have been using this word. Um, and that holds a huge, huge potential. Um, and, you know, there are already two things that are included in the sustainable food systems all, at least when we hear it from the commission, it's sustainability labeling um, and uh, sustainable public procurement and minimum criteria for sustainable public procurement. And I think that's great. Um, what I'd also like to see, and I have said it in the beginning, would be some sort of consideration of how to rebalance um, our system in terms of costs. I think Petra also said, well, you said nature doesn't have a paycheck. And I think that's completely true. It doesn't. Uh, and currently we externalize way too many um, externalities that we should be internalizing in our food production. Um, so I think I, I'll stop there <laughs> with, with my final remarks. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sylvia. Petra, you go. Yeah, very, very briefly. As a scientist, I always find it um, <clears throat> sad that there is no one truth, you know, but we probably have to have to live with this. And this maybe there's a relation back to the to the outcomes data, make the data available, and then people can discuss, you know, how, how to get and how to improve there and leave the plural, plurality open. Um, I think Enter, we are in terms of what I would love to see, you know, we are committed to get sustainability. So better soil health, better greenhouse gas emission balance, better biodiversity into our innovation. And we hope that the food systems legislation will enable products that prove any contribution a better market access than Europe. So that's our expectation for the law. Thank you. Thanks very much, Petra. Laurent, any final comments? Yeah, very quickly. I just want to commend Jessica for having told what I wanted to say in a much more eloquent way. So <laughs> I think we are very much aligned. I don't want to add anything to this. <clears throat> Thank you also, Sylvia, for you know mentioning things which were actually part of the of the process that we did last year. You know, we, we had people involved in, in public procurement and we had a lot of discussion about the food councils and things like that. So I, I I could recognize a lot of what you're saying from the discussions we heard in our in our project. And uh, yes, I agree also with Petra in terms of you know how to deal with nature and making sure that somebody has the voice of nature because otherwise we're going to be in, in trouble. So and anyway, again, thanks a lot for the 
very interesting conversations for having invited me here. And uh, I'm glad to see that actually we're all pretty much in line. Thank you. Thank you, Laurent, for those, those final words. As you know, as you can see, all, all is now time, uh, time to close. I fully agree that we have a very rich debate, very constructive views, very uh, interesting angles. And I think that thanks to, to you all, uh, speakers, panelists, I think you made this a very, very nice flow of ideas, a very interesting, uh, really a conversational, which is not sometimes easy to achieve on an online setting. But I think we are getting there finally, and we are managing to, to get really good, really good debates like the one we have today. There would be a lot more ground to cover. I mean, that's for sure. I mean, today I think it was basically a con with, with, with call it a kind of a conversation starter. There would be many, uh, many more things that we would like to discuss, and I hope there will be more, many more opportunities. I, I would say in the in the next uh, in the next few months and uh, to to keep discussing and, and informing with that with our debates the uh, the policy making process. We know that the European Commission is holding the pen on what will be in this law, uh, but I think they are really in, in listening mode and they are really uh, receptive to, to, to input. So let's, let's, let's say, let's play ball. Let's, let's be there, let's discuss, let's, let's bring our views uh, to the table and, uh, and, and let's see how, how it, it pans out. So with that, thank you again to all of you for your participation today and let me wish you a very good rest of the day. Goodbye. <laughs>